after seminars, and then he will leave, and faculty will remain to have a discussion on the project today. And I will request letters May 11th. So if anyone has to leave before then, I'll send around an email to ask you and get all the information and remind you of that due date. Without any further ado, Tomo. Thank, Thank you. Me. Thank you, Rebecca. So everybody knows I'm Tomo. So thank you very much for coming here today. I'm excited to talk about my uh, progress and accomplishment that I have done uh, since 2016 fall. So mainly I'll be talking about my research program that I established and some accomplishments about uh, seed biology. So my focus is seed development and, and I have three main projects, programs going on. But before I'm going to details of my research, let me briefly summarize what I have done so far within this um, less than two years. So I established my lab, Seed Molecular Biology Laboratory, including me and undergraduate students. We have currently eight members. Then uh, my research program, DOE of 75%. So as I said, I have developed three main projects that I'm going to talk about. Then uh, once a year, I attend a conference nationally or internationally to just show myself present and then uh, some updates of my research. And so far, uh, five publications um, with UK affiliation, so Department of Plant and uh, Soil Sciences. Then uh, I have submitted seven proposals so far. So this is the 75% the of DOE. Then I have teaching DOE of 25%. So I'm now responsible for teaching PLS 103 in the fall and ABT 495 in the spring. And this is three hour credit and four hour credit uh, hours. And currently I have two PhD students in my lab supervising. And luckily I got one uh, visiting PhD student in which I'm gonna talk about a little bit. Then the research activities and services. So, so far I got invited um, to three institutions for uh, giving a talk. And then uh, I became a review editor starting this year in uh, Frontiers in Plant Sciences. Then luckily I got to be involved in um, this UK bi seed biology group, Dr. Sharon Perry, Dr. Bruce Downey, Dr. Lynette Dirk. So um, we got together and I got a part of the, uh, this Kentucky American Water Fate County Science Fair to present what we are doing at UK in terms of seed biology. So um, this is the kind of a brief summary of my accomplishments. Let's get into uh, one by one. So first teaching. So as I said, in the fall, I taught uh, PLS 103 last, uh, last fall, 2017. It was really hard because uh, my background is molecular cellular biology, plant biology. And in this PLS 103 deals with the big picture of agriculture, including soil science, and the way we farm lands. And just, I learned a lot, but I spent so much time. And, and at the time I felt like I didn't do well, but in terms of the review that I got, um, average is 4.1 from the course mean, and the instructor mean is 4.1. So apparently students took in a positive way, but I didn't feel like did my best. So definitely I'm gonna improve myself, but I think it was a good start. And because of PLS 103, I spent so much time for preparation and I didn't want to spend the same amount of time for this um, spring 2018, which is this semester. So just I, um, actually this ABT 495 was already well established by Dr. Luke Moore. So I just follow his, um, the syllabus and everything. So I think it, it's going well. And, and of course the great help from Dr. Luke Moore and then Art Hunt for this ABT 495. I haven't got any evaluation yet, but my plan is next year when I teach uh, ABT 495 spring 2019, I'm gonna incorporate plant biology section because that's my background and that's my strengths and my interest. So I wanna make it more interesting uh, from my perspective. So that's my plan. So I'm gonna spend more time to um, organize this ABT 495 next year, but not this year. So about the lab. So as I said, currently I have eight members, including me. 
So first, Anthony Clark joined as a, a technician, and then uh, Reagan Crossfield, uh, she's an ABT student, undergrad student, who uh, did ABT 301 and 95 in my lab, and Sam is a worker student. Then later on, Rachel uh, Costa, she joined as an ABT 395 undergraduate program. Then, as I said, I have two PhD students. So Folte, he joined in my lab 2017 August, and then he's supported by the department. And another PhD student, Fatima, she joined in my lab um, this January, and I decided to use part of my startup fund to have uh, Fatima as a PhD student. Then, uh, luckily, uh, Zen, he came from uh, Chinese uh, University in China as a visiting PhD student. So he has his own background from plant pathology, but we, uh, I do imaging, live imaging. So we combine them together and he's working on a PhD uh, project, which is gonna be given by Chinese, uh, Chinese university, but he's working in my lab as well. So maybe some of the people think about why I decided to have Fatima as a second PhD student using from my startup fund is simply because the funding situation. So, as I said, I've been working on getting external fund and I, I submitted seven proposals, but the situation is very tough. So the key is I submitted uh, one to USDA together with Monsi Salmeron and a one NSF proposal and was rejected. But the reviewers were positive about my idea, so they liked the idea. But the, the, what they're saying is that I need more preliminary data to support my idea. In order to get the data, I need people in my, in my lab. So I talked with the former chair, Dr. Pfeiffer, and I decided to use some of the money to support another student. That's why I have two students, one supported by the department, one as I'm supporting from startup funding. But, so I've been trying, and then uh, I think as, I, as long as I get uh, data, I, I, I have a positive feeling about uh, getting money in the future. So I don't worry too much about it for now. Okay, so now we can go into science. So as I said, um, my job here to work on seed biology, seed science, and try to understand seed development from molecular cellular biology point of view, but not just only basic science, I'm trying to link with agricultural part, which is seed size and yield control. And then I'm working not only Arabidopsis, but also soybean so that I can combine um, this basic biology with actual uh, application to crop plants. When it comes to seed development, of course, it's, it's a long process and many processes are happening from fertilization to uh, dormancy or uh, desiccation. So my focus is actually very early stage of seed development, starting from fertilization to early phase seed development. And then I'm gonna talk about more uh, the scientific reasons why I'm focusing on later, but actually how I started to focus on this early stage is simply because of this publication. So this is not from me. It was published in 2011 by Yuki Hamamura et al. in Current Biology. So this was the first time live imaging, real time, visualizing fertilization process in Arabidopsis. So these reds are sperm nuclei marked and then the green colors are female cells. And this is one of the female gamete called central cell and an egg cell is somewhere here, it's not uh, visualized. But as you can see, these sperm cells are released from pollen tube and moving towards female gametes for fertilization. And then when I saw this one, it's like, wow, we can do this? Can you see inside the seed without dissecting everything out? So I got interested in this fertilization process. That's how I started to study fertilization process in flowering plants with live imaging. So the first question I had is how this movement controlled? This is like a 10 minute and everything is completed. So I first uh, tried to understand this process in Arabidopsis. 
that's how I initiated this seed biology or fertilization process as one, one of my uh, program. So what do we know about fertilization process? Nothing or the very little thing was known in plants, but lots of things was known already in animals. So in animal case, uh, we know that one of cytoskeleton called microtubules are generated around sperm cell nucleus. And then this cable or the tubes find female, so egg cell nucleus, and then pull this egg cell nucleus towards male for fertilization. And this is well known in animal systems. But as you can see in plants, the movement is opposite. Instead of um, female exonucleus moving towards male, actually male, so red, this nuclei are female, uh, sorry, do, uh, red colors encode, uh, show sperm nuclei, and this male side is moving towards the female. That's the fertilization process happening in Arabidopsis. So it's, the direction is opposite. So the question is, is it the same mechanism or completely different mechanisms happening in Arabidopsis? So the first question, of course, is this microtubule important animal fertilization also important in plant fertilization? So first I look for a mutants which cannot uh, generate microtubules so that I can test whether microtubules are important for fertilization process in Arabidopsis. And luckily, this uh, mutant called PILTS is already uh, published and showing that the microtubules cannot be generated because this PILTS encode for protein important for tubulins dimerizing to make this microtubule structure. So if you don't have PILTS, you cannot make any microtubules and it's lethal. But the thing is, it's lethal, but people didn't study whether fertilization was successful or not. So utilizing this line, I decided to check whether fertilization can be successful in this Pilz mutant first. How are we gonna check fertilization success? We can use this sperm chromatin, sperm nuclei marked by red. So in the pollen grain, there are two sperm uh, nuclei and then a uh, we can mark by red fluorescence protein. And as you can see, there are two dots here and it's very compacted. So it's not like a dot, but it's dot-like structure, very tiny one. But during the fertilization, it gets decondensed and you're gonna see it here. So first, these sperm chromatins are in the pollen, compacted and then released to this female gamete. So you have egg cell here, in the central cell here. And then this egg cell is marked by green now. And now sperm cells are released. Then after successful fertilization, what happened is that this compacted red color uh, sperm chromatin is fused with female gamete nuclei and decompaction happens. As a result, you can see kind of blurry big uh, area of red. This shows that male and a female nuclei fused already and mixed together in a cell, uh, in a nucleus. Therefore, this sperm chromatin can be seen in a big area decondensed. So this is used as a success of fertilization. And then I decided to use this one to check, going back to Pilt's mutant, whether microtubule is important for fertilization in Arabidopsis. So in wild type, it's not clear here, but the decondensation, decompaction of red color already happened both egg cell and a central cell here. This is wild type situation. In a Pilz mutant case, we see the same thing. So decompaction of sperm nuclear happened already in egg cell and a central cell, showing that microtubules are not important. It's disp disp dispensable for fertilization in Arabidopsis case. And then this is already uh, found in rice and um, uh, tobacco. So we know that these microtubules are not important for many flowering plants, but this is different from animals. So this was the first um, the, uh, finding that we got 
that plants utilize in something different for fertilization process. Then question is, what is it? So now we know microtubules are not important for fertilization in plants. Then just um, how about the other cytoskeleton, actin filaments? That's how I get into actin filament uh, analysis in plants. So I decided to focus on F-actin, whether F-actin important for fertilization. So first, we didn't have any mutants uh, which cannot have actin uh, functions because actin filaments, uh, actin genes a lot in, in, uh, in Arabidopsis. So just mutation of one doesn't cause anything. So first, what I did is try to find how I can defunctionalize actin in the egg cell. So I found the literature talking about muta mutated version of actin, and I specifically expressed this mutated version of actin in the egg cell. And as a result, as you can see, this is the wild type actin filaments. And uh, in this mutant background that I generated, now they cannot make any filamentous actins, showing that now actin is defective in this particular line. Then I can ask the question, is that if actin is important for fertilization. So I did the same analysis with this sperm chromatin decompaction. In a wild type situation, decompaction happened nicely. But in the case of this mutant background, sperm cell nucleus gets into the egg cell, but decompaction doesn't happen. And then actually egg cell nucleus is here. As a result, in a wild type situation, nice embryo can be generated. But in the case of mutant, no embryo generated, showing that, yes, actin is somehow important for fertilization process in Arabidopsis. So, good or not, flowering plants have not only one fertilization, but there's another second called second fertilization, double fertilization. So, as I said, egg cell, is one female gamete, but central cell is also another female gamete which fertilize. That's why in the pollen grain, we have two sperm cells. One fertilizes with the egg cell, the other one goes to the central cell. So not only one fertilization event, two fertilization events happen. That's the flowering plants having double fertilization. And then previously I showed in the egg cell, f is important. How about in the central cell? Is it the same or different? So I did pretty much the same thing, but now just specifically defunctionalizing actin function in a central cell, but not the egg cell, then did the fertilization assay. So in wild type, nice decompaction of uh, sperm uh, chromatin happens here and here, but in the case of mutant background now which has defect in central cell. The egg cell case, chromatin compaction of sperm happens nicely. You cannot see much here, but there's a decompaction of uh, red color here. But in a central cell, as you can see, just no compaction, uh, no decompaction. So the sperm nucleus just stays there and this is the central cell nucleus, and there is no fusion happen. As a result, we can generate nice embryo because fertilization is fine in the egg cell, but in the central cell, there's no endosperm development happens. So this shows that both case, egg cell and the central cell, F-actin is important for fertilization process. The beauty of central cell is yes, egg cell and central cell, they do the same thing if actin is important, but at the same time, the cell size is much, much bigger than the egg cell. So this is the central cell size, and an egg cell size is here. It's not shown here, but this is the egg cell size. Because the size is much bigger, visualization of cables and structures is much easier, and high resolution results can be obtained utilizing this central cell. And what you show, uh, see here, the cyan shows actin cables in a central cell, 
and a magenta shows synergy cells, these are accessory cells, and exonucleus is shown in, in uh, yellow. But the key is utilizing central cell, I might be able to get more uh, fine structure and the detail of how effectin is important for fertilization process. So instead of utilizing egg cell, now I stick with the central cell to dissect out more details, molecular function of this actin filament. So this is the dynamics of actin filaments in a central cell before fertilization. What we see now is the cables are generated somewhere outside and they're moving towards the center, like somewhere from here to here. In the center, there's a nucleus located. So this is the scheme that if actin is somehow generated, maybe plasma membrane area, and then moving towards the center where central cell nucleus is located. And what we found is that actual this sperm nucleus movement is together with this effective movement what we found in this central cell. So indeed this movement somehow driving or moving this sperm cell nucleus towards the center where nucleus is located for fertilization. So now uh, the question is how this movement of effectin is regulated in a central cell. So this is fertilization process, but actual actin dynamics is well studied in other um, systems such as roots and uh, leaves. And then lots of factors are already uh, identified and known to regulate actin organization. So utilizing this information, I try to find which factor may be important for this effect in uh, dynamics in the female gamete cell. So in order to do that, of course, I picked all those factors which are known to be uh, actin regulator, but also I utilized the publicly available transcriptomic analysis so that I specifically picked some of the genes that are highly active in the uh, reproduction phase. And one of them is this rho GTPase. So this rho GTPase is bound to the plasma membrane and then sending a signal to uh, positively enhanced actin filament uh, generation. And then one of this rho GTPase is actually found to be highly expressed in a reproductive timing. So, re uh, this is just the gene expression profiling of 11 members of rho GTPases. And yellow shows high expression and blue shows low expression from different um, tissues, cell types. So I found this rho GTPase 8 is actually highly uh, active in this central cell lineage, including endosperm, because fertilization of central cell gives endosperm. So I decided to study this uh, rho GTPS8, whether this rho GTPS is important for this dynamic movement of a pectin in a central cell. To do that, first I confirmed this rho GTPS8 is specifically expressed in the egg cell using this uh, promoter marker line. And then also I confirmed that this localization of rho GTPS8 is on the plasma membrane. And we can do that by just tagging this fluorescent marker to the gene or promoter to identify expression pattern or sublocalization within a cell. So I confirmed that the rogtp 8 is a good candidate and I generated knockdown of this rogtp 8 and then see whether actin dynamics is altered or not. So in the wild type situation, and then this, uh, the right side shows the dominant negative, so dominant uh, knockdown of rogtp 8 and what we found is, yes, indeed, knockdown of rho GTPase 8 retards this dynamic movement of effectin in a central cell. As a result, as you can see, no decondensation, no de decompaction of sperm chromatin happens. Uh, we cannot see here much, 
In Excel, it's fine because this rho GTPS is specifically expressed in a central cell. So dominant negative function only happens in a central cell. As a result, central cell cannot have fertilization, but egg cell can have successful fertilization. So I found that rho GTPS8 is part of the regulators controlling this dynamic effective movement in a central cell. So this work was done in, uh, during my postdoc. And what we found is, this is a summary, that actin, if actin is generated somehow around this plasma membrane periphery and moving towards the center of the cell where nucleus is located. And then once sperm cell is, uh, nucleus is inserted, this actin filament kind of find this sperm cell nucleus and wrap it up, then move towards the center of the cell, utilizing this inward movement of effectin for successful fertilization. So this was done uh, during my postdoc. Then I have lots of questions, and one of them is, okay, so everything was done in a central cell, but how about egg cell? Do, do you, do, does egg cell use the same uh, system or not? But the key is, rho GTPS that I found is specific to the central cell. It's not expressed in an egg cell, and a dominant negative form didn't affect fertilization in the uh, egg cell. So it was, very, uh, it was just questionable whether another ROP uh, is doing the same thing in egg cell or not. So this was the kind of a first approach, uh, the experiment that I did when I came here. And then Anthony helped me to just um, finish all the work. So during the process, we actually found another ROP is actually active in entire female gametes. So not only the central cell, uh, but also the egg cell and another synergic cells called accessory cells of the female gamete, this rho GTPase is expressed in these uh, cells. So it's not specific to the egg cell, but specific to the female gamete, uh, female gametophyte. Then we just pretty much did the same thing, generated the dominant negative form of this uh, egg drop, and then tested whether this affects dynamics of effectin in egg cell. So this is the, the movie uh, shows that the uh, effectin dynamics in the wild type, it's moving again um, towards here. And in the here, we have egg cell nucleus. So the cable is moving towards this, uh, the exonucleus. And in a dominant negative form ROP case, cables are there, but the movement is not that much. And then this might not be clear. So I generated this overlays of each uh, time and color coded. And then if cables don't move, then all the colors in the same spot becoming white. And as you can see, in a wild type, cables are moving. That's why you still see these individual colors. But in the case of dominant negative ROP, we see mostly white, which means that the cables are not moving. So in the case of um, egg cell, not ROP8, but another ROP is activated and doing the same thing. So pretty much the, the consensus is, doesn't matter which gene, but rho GTPase is important for dynamic movement of effect in both egg cell and a central cell. And uh, this inward movement of ifactin is important for fertilization. So this shows the, whether it's uh, the actual fertilization assay in this rho GDPase egg rope case. And then this is the wild type, as I show, compaction of sperm cell uh, uh, in a pollen grain. But after release and a fertilization success, you get this, this decompaction of sperm chromatin. And in the case of this dominant negative of rope, egg drop, what we see is no decompaction of sperm chromatin in the egg. So this egg drop is really important for fertilization in egg cell. So what we found is actually in the central cell, rho GTPS8 is important. And in the case of egg, another ROP is important. So I asked the question, so there are two ROPs taking care of fertilization independently. 
why and how this happened. So I just check all these available uh, genomes of plants and then check which species have ROP8 homolog or ROP9 homolog, uh, egg ROP homolog. And what I found is this egg ROP is pretty much conserved in entire uh, uh, angiosperms. The rho GDPS8, which is central cell specific, is actually only found in eudicots. So I couldn't go further details why and how, but the key is monocots doesn't have, uh, monocots don't have this central cell rho GTPs here. So maybe the fertilization process could be different in monocots, but nothing is not known, the difference between eudicots and monocots when it comes to fertilization. So this is another uh, field of uh, projects that I might go into in the future, but not for now. So what we found is only just egg rub, maybe the ancient one, and a rub eight diverged after this diversification of eudicots and other uh, flowering plants. So we now know this rho GTPs, either egg rope or rope eight in a central cell, either way, it's important for generating this dynamics. Of course, this itself cannot generate this dynamic movement of effectiveness. So PhD student Folte um, did kind of a mini chemical screening to identify what factors uh, are important for generating this dynamic movement. So we can utilize different chemicals, speci specifically in, uh, inhibiting um, myosin or forming all these uh, targets. And we found that myosin is somehow involved in this actin organization. And formins, this is the nucleator of um, actin filaments, are also important. And uh, about this rho GTPase pathway, we found actually this pathway is involved in uh, this dynamic effective movement. So formins and rho GTPase are already known to control actin organization in roots and leaves, but myosin is not well known. And then this is actually first time to find out actin, uh, myosin itself is organizing or important for actin organization. So we focused on myosin and how and what myosin is uh, controlling this actin organization in this uh, central cell. So the first project I initiated here is this, how does myosin control affect in dynamics in a central cell? Actually, I found one uh, myosin gene specifically active in a central cell in the case of synergid cells, these are accessory cells of female gametophyte, but it's very specific to female gamete, gametophyte, sorry. Then I got the mutant, and as a result, what we found is the cable structures, this is uh, this myosin mutant generate this thicker uh, filaments compared to wild type, and a movement is also affected. So in a wild type, we can have a nice movement from uh, plasma membrane periphery to the center of the cell, but in the case of myosin mutant, uh, the movement gets retarded. So uh, right now, Fatima, another PhD student, is focusing on how this myosin that I found uh, control this actin dynamic movement in a central cell. So uh, the first questions we are addressing is where in this central cell myosin is localized. So sublocalization could be associated with the actin here or actin here or actin here. We don't know yet. And then what are the factors that uh, are interacting with this myosin? Because this is the first um, time that we found that myosin is involved in actin organization. Therefore, we don't know anything about how this myosin uh, controls. So we need to find maybe novel interactors, uh, myosin and an actin filaments are in, uh, connected. And of course, as I said, it's very new. So whatever models we can come up with based on the new data will be new. So hopefully we can get kind of a uh, important the biological aspect of cell biological aspect of this actin dynamics and the myosin function, not only from, uh, for fertilization process, 
but from cell biology perspective. Therefore, I submitted the, uh, the, this proposal related to this project to uh, NSF MCB, and it's still pending. So we don't know yet whether I get funded or not. But I think this is very new, and uh, uh, it's very important to ask. So, till now, I just talked about only this fertilization process. And as I said, this is just the beginning of seed biology. And when you look at the seed, seed development, of course, there are so many interesting processes happening in a seed. Of course, after fertilization, the fertilized egg cell, zygote, has to develop embryos to make next generation plant. And a central cell, after fertilization, they make endosperm. But early stage of endosperm is very unique because they do nuclear divisions without cytokinesis. So here we have liquid endosperm having many nuclei in one big, large endosperm. Then later on, somehow, they just do sterilization. So at the end, one cell, one nucleus, but this is very unique. And not only important for cell biology, but now lots of uh, evidence from Arabidopsis and rice showing that the duration of this liquid endosperm development is linked, tightly linked with the seed size. So longer duration, you make bigger seeds. In a shorter duration, you make small seeds. We have no idea why, but um, this somehow, this unique liquid endosperm is related to the si final seed size. So I decided to also work on this, how this unique liquid endosperm development is controlled in Arabidopsis, utilizing similar approach, which is live cell imaging. So now we can mark endosperm nuclei, magenta, and an F-actin, actin cables in green. And what we found is many nuclei, of course, nuclear uh, liquid endosperm, but now we can visualize nuclear divisions, actual endosperm development with uh, actin cable dynamics. As you can see, some of the nuclei are just moving toward here, generating aggregates, and which is known, but we have no idea about the function. And this is actually the first time to show in actin dynamics and nuclear division and nuclear movement at the same time. And in here, generating like aster-shaped structures around each nucleus, this is also new. And we're trying to understand how these actin filaments are involved in this unique liquid endosperm development. How? It's a teamwork. So not only just one part, this entire lab now trying to understand what factors involved in this um, such a unique development in, in, in endosperm. So from Anthony, Forte, Fatima, and uh, John, everybody's trying to understand this one by looking at gene by gene. So we found now forming 12, one of the nucleator of actin is important for this endosperm development. So how did we do that? So as I explained, there's lots of factors already known to control actin organization. And I went to expression profiling to fish out genes that are highly enriched in endosperm. And one of them is this forming, 12. And we confirmed that expression is confined to uh, endosperm. And now we are studying what's the function of this forming 12 when it comes to liquid endosperm development and seed size. So Reagan Crossfield, ABT student, uh, she uh, took this project under uh, the help of Forte and Anthony. And what we found is forming 12 mutant shows embryo developmental delay. So this is the wild type image showing two days after pollination. We have a nice pre-globular, tiny globular stage embryo here. Then four days after pollination, it, it grows to make kind of a torpedo shape embryo. The thing is, in wild type, it takes about four days to get torpedo. But in the case of forming 12 mutant, two days is fine. They have nice globular stage embryo. But at four days, they don't have um, torpedo embryos, but this heart stage and globular stage embryos. So here's the kind of a, the uh, data. 
So two days after pollination, we didn't see any difference between wild pep and forming 12 mutants. But four days after pollination, now we start seeing delay of development. Because in wild type, we get 100% torpedo stage embryo. But in the case of forming 12 mutant, we have a good 20% of Cs are showing delay. So right now, we are trying to understand, do we see any seed site changes between wild type and forming 12 mutant? How about affecting dynamics in an endosperm under this forming 12 mutant background? And why developmental delay happens only this 20% fraction, and most likely due to re gene redundancy, because our adopters have many uh, copies of genes in the genome. So one mutation doesn't uh, give us much phenotype. Could be that's why we get this just 20%. So by having double, triple mutants, we can get maybe more quantitatively uh, um, larger number of defects. And of course, this is just the beginning, forming 12. So we're gonna work in other factors as well. But this is try to understand how this liquid endosperm is controlled. And not only that, so just a few days ago, I met um, the one faculty, young faculty at the uh, College of Engineering at UK. And we discussed about this kind of a force or the biophys uh, biophysics um, part of uh, this development. And he was really excited about um, the findings that I have, how these guys are well organized in a, in a well, uh, the even space manner and then how these, these acting cables are organized this, and from the biophysics point of view, which is completely different from my perspective, but we are trying to come up with a proposal from my biology and in a physics, biophysics point of view to, um, so that we might be able to uh, have some interesting aspect of this liquid endosperm development as well. So, so, these two projects are pretty much based on Arabidopsis data. And of course, even though we found some interesting data, it doesn't mean that we can directly apply to crop plants. So it's important that to work on crop species to uh, do the proof of concept. So not only Arabidopsis, I decided to work on soybean, simply because we have um, great soybean um, uh, workers here and in a, uh, I had some experiences with um, beans before. So that's why I decided to start working on soybean first. So I just did the, lots of literature search and a great help from uh, doc, uh, Dennis, Dr. Dennis, Dennis Egri about this, um, the classical information of uh, what's known about soybean development, seed development. And then what, we, what I found, which I didn't know, is that very early stage of soybean development or any crop development, uh, seed development, is very sensitive to environments to set the final seed size. So this shows the time, so fertilization to mature seeds, and this is the weight, so the size of the seeds. And in an early stage, it's called lag phase, the actual development is very tiny, so you don't see much uh, uh, physical growth. And later on, you see this linear growth, it was the physical growth that you see to fill the pod, then undergo maturation. So the people found this lag phase, early phase of development is very, very sensitive to environments. And indeed, what's happening in this lag phase is this liquid endosperm development. So I made a hypothesis that maybe this liquid endosperm development in crops also tightly linked with the the seed size um, uh, setup. So um, now I'm trying to understand from gene expression and the developmental point of view, how environments can control these um, duration of uh, liquid endosperm development. So this work is not only uh, done by me, but also the collaboration with Monsi. So Monsi is also interested in more like a physical growth of cotyledons at here. So we are working together, given different environments, such as different temperatures or photo periods, and then check how uh, this development is affected and now gene regulation changes or not. So how are we gonna do that? 
I established the confocal microscopy imaging uh, with soybean seeds, and I successfully now visualized liquid endosperm, and this is the preglobular embryo here in a soybean, and a cellular endosperm, and it's globular stage embryo without sectioning. So now we can use confocal microscope to visualize what stage these seeds are and then whether endosperm is liquid or cellularized by using this uh, technique. And then how are we gonna do transcriptomic analysis? We're gonna apply laser capture microdissection. So this is a section of soybean seed and we can use laser to capture only embryo or endosperm or seed code separately and extract RNA to check a transcriptomic analysis, uh, to do the gene regulation, uh, gene expression profiling. So combining those two, we should be able to get this uh, development and a gene regulation under different environment conditions. So Forte, um, my PhD student, is now taking care of this project. So we start it now. So this is a summary. So I established three projects in here. First one is this how this uh, F-actin dynamics in a female gamete is controlled. And Fatima is working on this project. Then uh, how this liquid endosperm development is controlled in Arabidopsis is a teamwork. And in a soybean seed development with the environmental conditions with Forte is now taking care. And I don't have time to talk about, but there's a collaboration between uh, Dr. Lin Yuan's lab and my lab uh, by uh, her, uh, his postdoc, Ji Min Shin. She's interested in gene, uh, seed gene regulatory networks. And then I have lots of transcription factors highly enriched in endosperm. And then she is studying those transcription factors, how seed gene uh, um, expressions are controlled. So this is also a great collaboration that I, I participate in right now. So future plans. Of course, because I established these three projects, I'm gonna focus on to establish and stabilize these projects and get preliminary data for uh, NSF, USDA extra grants. But once um, this is set, I'm also interested in evolution of sexual plant reproduction in, a, in land plants. As you can see in the male part, when you look at the lower plants or early diverging plants, they have multi-sperm and then just they swim to find the egg. But in the case of seed plants, gymnosperms and angiosperms, they created pollen, pollen grain, pollen tubes. And then at the end, in angiosperms, they completely uh, lost multi-sperm. So sperms are immortal, immortal. In the case of female, so embryo was invented in the, in the land plants, but along the evolution, the seed was invented and the endosperm was created in angiosperms. So I kind of vaguely interested in what, what genes are controlling those things. So uh, utilizing Marcantia polymorpha, which, is, uh, which belongs to this liverworts, the, one of the most early diverging land plants. And in this plant is now a model plant because the genome is sequenced already and it's transformable. And, and I was part of the genome uh, paper of this Marcantia. So I have all these techniques and, and uh, uh, resources. So in the future, not right now, I would like to establish this Marcantia project to understand evolution of sexual plant reproduction in land plants. So um, I talked a lot, but um, at the end, of course, I really need to thank all the lab members because sometimes I get cranky and then irritated, but everybody's working so hard and I really appreciate that. And Anthony, from the beginning, he helped me to establish the lab, very helpful. So I, I cannot lose you now, so please stay. And of course, uh, Dr. Seth DeBolt, without his confocal microscope, I wouldn't be able to do any of the work that I presented here today. So I really appreciate um, his uh, kindness uh, entire lab is now freely access to his confocal microscope, and I, I, I'm really thankful for that. And then I have uh, faculty mentors, Dr. Sharon Perry, Dr. Luke Mo, Dr. Lin Yan. I get tons of suggestions and comments, really appreciate. And then the collaborators, so Dr. Monty Salmeron, we started Soybean Project, and Dr. Ji Min Shin, 
uh, together with Dr. Uh, Lin's lab. And of course, department and the former chair, Dr. Tom Pfeiffer, I went to your office many times to get some comments. Thank you very much. And now uh, the current chair, now I'm coming to you now. Thank you. And of course, Dr. Dennis Egley, initiation of this soybean project. I had lots of insights from him. And thank you for your attention. Right. So um, it's a very important question that our field also asks. So what we know right now is egg cell has polyspermy block. We don't know why and how, but just based on genetics and, and uh, the live imaging, we know that egg cell almost 100% just gets only one sperm cell nucleus for fertilization. Central cell, on the other hand, it has much, much less loose, uh, much loose. So that if you create, let's say, four sperm cells in a pollen grain, and then four sperm cells release to these female gametes, what happens is that one goes to the egg cell, the rest of, rest of them goes to the central cell. So um, they use the same mechanism, but many things are different at the same time. And it's still black box. And then just we, as a community, trying to understand what is making egg cell, poly, you know, just um, one sperm cell. And then a, a central cell is more like a kind of a buffer in a way. That's, that's maybe evolutionary positive. That's why it's kind of selected to be that way. But we have no idea from the molecular biology perspective yet. Yes. Yep. So, um, so based on my knowledge, so I don't know all the uh, species, but based on my knowledge, many of them have liquid endosperm phase and cellularization happens. Uh, but few species actually, they don't have any liquids, liquid endosperm, like tobacco seeds, they don't have any liquid endosperm phase immediately undergo cytokinesis after fertilization. But when it comes to the fraction, this, uh, what I show here, like rice, corn, Arabidopsis, soybean, they have this liquid endosperm phase and a cellularization phase. So when it comes to um, uh, seed crop, grain crops, most likely what I study here is relevant to many species. But in the coconut, yes, um, they keep some of the endosperm liquid and then some of the portion cellularized. And then, uh, they have, I think, completely different regulations. We don't, I don't know. Yeah. So why did animals evolve to use microtubules and plants? That's a good question. So interestingly, Leverworts, these uh, uh, mosses and ferns, mm -hmm. they actually use microtubules. So there's a strong link between multi-sperm and the utilization of microtubules. Gymnosperm is a mixture, so I'm not gonna go into details, but when it comes to flowering plants, we already tested, not only my group, other groups tested in tobacco and uh, rice and Arabidopsis, in my case, they all use my, uh, actins. So then why there's a tight link between multi-sperm and then the utilization of microtubules? Most likely centrosome. So centrosome is the organelle, which is the kind of a cofactor to generate microtubules. Mm -hmm. and, in, in, and in this centrosome can change their form to basal body. So these are analogous things. And then basal body is important for 
flagella formation. And a flagella formation is important for motility. Therefore, maybe there's a strong link with motility, basal body, centrosome, and microtubule. And then that is just kept strongly in the entire kingdom except flowering plants. And then why flowering plants did that is a mystery, but probably they lost motility, so they don't need um, any like microtubule organizations anymore. And then, but uh, so is there an energetic difference between generating? I see. Uh, that's an interesting point. I didn't, I didn't study much about this energy point of view. So um, one, the people talk about the centrosome is dispensable actually, you don't need that. But these, they keep. And a centrosome sometimes is very important for um, um, equal division. So centrosome is a kind of a center for setting up where division should be. And then they can use less energy to make equal division. But if you wanna make asymmetrical division, you need to have extra power when you have centrosomes. And then when it comes to plants, maybe they lost centrosomes in the flowering plants, and they didn't have to worry anything about this energy, well, but just I'm guessing. So, um, but that's an interesting point that I think we, some group, not me, but um, can study more energy point of view. Yes, that's right. Thank you.